Hello and welcome to our online worship for this festival service, the Ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. We apologize for the delay, but you know what? Control is really one of the words that we've got to talk about today, and it's maybe just a great reminder, we're not in control, but we know who is. As we celebrate the Ascension of our Lord, we celebrate his coronation as King. And that shows he's still in control, yes, but that also gives comfort to his people, because the Jesus who ascended sent his Holy Spirit so that this message about Jesus, who lived, died, and rose, would be proclaimed for the forgiveness of his people. That's why Jesus came, it's also why Jesus left, and so that will be the focus of our worship. We begin our worship with the opening hymn. <laughs>
Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. In the glow of the Lord's resurrection, let us draw near confessing our sins and receiving the precious and firm gift of forgiveness. Eternal Lord God, by your own word, you open the minds of those who hear to understand that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and that you call us to repent of our sins and believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, that for his sake you forgive all sin. So we repent of all our sins and ask for your forgiveness. Upon this, your confession, I, as a called servant of the Word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, King of glory, on this day you ascended far above the heavens, and at God's right hand you rule the nations. Leave us not alone, we pray, but grant us the spirit of truth, that at your command and by your power, we may be your witnesses in all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In our first scripture lesson, we see that although the disciples were confused at Jesus leaving, Jesus gave to the church clear marching orders to be his witnesses in all the world. A lesson from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his supper, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the date, times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here, looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The Word of the Lord.
basis for the sermon, a lesson from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 through 23. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The word of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Alleluia. As Christ has ascended, I invite you to stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel according to the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. He, that is Jesus, told them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. He also said to them, This is what is written, The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I am sending you what my Father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. Then he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. After worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple, praising God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We confess our faith with the saints of all time using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was the incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under the conscious idol. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
special consideration. It's recorded in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 through 23. Since those words are a prayer, let's begin our time in God's word with a prayer. God, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you better. Amen. Subjects of our ascended king. Elvis has left the building. Some of you may actually be old enough to remember how that phrase originated, but ever since 1977, those words have changed in meaning. That's when the king fell off the throne, if you know what I mean, and Elvis left not just the building, but planet Earth. As we celebrate the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ to the throne, maybe today we can't help but wonder, has Jesus left the building? Especially considering we're worshiping online, at home, instead of in the church building. And if Jesus has ascended the throne to be king, how is he using his power during this time of distress and danger? For that matter, why did Jesus leave at all? God answers that in his word. He tells us why Jesus left. To send the Spirit, to ascend the throne, and to fill up his fullness. Our sermon text is a pastor's prayer. This pastor, the Apostle Paul, wrote from prison, maybe isolated like many of us feel. More than that, he wrote to people he had not seen in years. How's that for social distancing? Still, from prison, Paul did not stop thanking God or praying. He wrote, I have not stopped thanking God for you, remembering you in my prayer. Like Paul, your pastors do not stop thanking God or praying for you once you have left the church building. No, we continue to thank God for you all the way until you reach our Savior's side in heaven. So, Paul's prayer is also your pastor's prayer, is also the prayer of all God's people for one another. We keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Paul prays that God would send the Holy Spirit. The Spirit gives wisdom. Wisdom's first step is trusting Jesus. The Spirit reveals this wisdom to us in his tool, the Bible, a tool like the carpenter's saw or like the writer's pen. Maybe you've learned it before. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. This simple song succinctly summarizes what Scripture says. Some have even said, Jesus loves me, this I know, and that's all I need to know. Well, that's fairly accurate. If you know that Jesus loves you, that he is your Savior who died, your God, that's all you need to know in this life to get to the next one. Why would we ever stop there? Might as well say, Jesus loves me, this I know, and that's all I want to know. That attitude comes not from a heart that loves and gives thanks to God, but from one that is completely absorbed with self. So we pray that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you may know him better. That's why Jesus left. Maybe you didn't know, Jesus said he actually left for our good. In John chapter 16, he says, It is for your good that I am going away, unless I go, unless I go away. The Advocate, that's the Holy Spirit. 
will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. One reason Jesus left was to send the Holy Spirit who gives wisdom so that we understand who God is and what he does for us. And so Paul's prayer continues. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. In English, we say, your eyes are the window into your soul. The thing about windows, though, is that they work two ways. If you drive in your car past another car, you can look into their window, yes, but they can look just as equally back into you, unless you've got tinted windows. Not unlike a former vicar here. But the problem with the eyes of our heart, they weren't just tinted, but tainted. So dark we could not even see out beyond ourselves. So of course we could not see in to what God has planned for us. Our sinful nature kept us spiritually blind and apart from God so that we could not understand what he's done from beginning to end. That means we were spiritually apart from God and unable to understand his power or how he uses that power against his enemies. Spiritually blind and in the dark. So Jesus, for that very reason, sent the Holy Spirit to give us insight into the hope to which he calls us. He calls us to this by the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And yet that word, hope, hardly seems to do it justice, at least not in English. Right? This is more than just something we hope and wish for, but the eager expectation of God's people, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Even if you are a millionaire with mansions upon mansions, all the wealth you've got is a drop in the bucket compared to the wealth of our God. He owns all the mansions in the world, all the 401ks, and all the precious gems. He owns the entire universe. There's nothing that is not his. Yet our God does not measure his wealth in those things. But in the saints, his holy people, and it's those same holy people who receive his inheritance, the saints. So to get the inheritance, you've got to be holy. Holy means fully dedicated to God. In other words, perfect. So then, how do we measure up to God's standard of perfection? Maybe you don't like stepping on the scale, whether it's because you don't like what you see, or because you're afraid you're, you'll break it. Trust me, I get it. But what would happen if we put our sin on that scale? What would it read? Might it break the scale? And even as heavy, as tremendously heavy as our sins truly are, they are nothing compared to the incomparably great power of our God. He's able to lift it. In fact, he did lift the weight of our sins for about six hours one Friday. As on a a cross, nailed to pieces of wood, he offered his life and bore the entire sin of all the world. That message is the incomparably great power that God has for us who believe. It's the message about Jesus, the message about the Jesus who sent his Holy Spirit. So we would believe it message that has such incomparably great power 
that it smashes the scale of our sin and guts the gravity of our guilt, power so great it makes you a saint, holy. Nothing can compare to this incomparably great power. All of the waifs and all the weight rooms of all the world don't even measure up to a fraction of a fraction of a percentage of God's lifting prowess. His power is so great that he became man. Power is so great, he stayed on the cross so he would be your perfect Savior. Power so great, God died. Power so great, he raised Jesus from the dead. And power so great, he raised Jesus even higher to the right hand of God, far above every rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, invoked not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Power that has promised to rescue you. Power that has promised that you will rise too. Power that has given you his riches in his glorious inheritance. That's why Jesus left. So he could prepare a mansion for you. So he would send the Spirit. So you would believe. Him. But that's not all. Christ, our King, ascended the throne. So he rules. We see it. He ascended the throne, took the crown, seized the scepter, and put his feet over his enemies, crushing them in the dust. Sin, death, and hell, and any other power there may be in the universe have lost their power. Sometimes. My dad can beat up your dad, the kid claims, confident in dad's combat prowess. That kid trusts dad. Like that we have a God who can beat up any other God or of any other force in heaven or on earth or in hell itself. He already trounced death. There's no enemy who can stand up to this power. No challenger who can enter the ring and seize his authority from him. In fact, that's why Jesus left. So that he would take up his authority, his power as God, once again, to rule the world for you. His people. So if he's taken up that power again, then why doesn't he use it? If coronavirus is the best that this king can do, what kind of God is Jesus? Christ the king's coronation causes complete comfort. He rules now. We rule with him now. God placed all things under his feet and appointed him head over everything for the church, which is his body. This Jesus rules the world. He is in control. And so I pray that God would open the eyes of your heart so that you see Christ in control. He has promised even to bend evil to his will. Nothing can snatch you from his powerful grip. So this king who rules all things for the church is like no other king and no other government that has never existed because he doesn't. All for you. He gave up heaven for you. He lived for you. He died for you. He rose for you and he rules for you. 
the same Jesus who sent his spirit into you so you would believe this message, also asks you to trust him when what he does doesn't make sense. In his wisdom, he has allowed wars, famines, earthquakes, floods, plagues. He has even allowed a pandemic to slow our country to a crawl. But he's promised he's in control. So what is there to worry about? Death? The economy? We believe in a God who has power over those things. All things are under his feet. He was appointed head over everything for the church. He uses his power for your good. So there's nothing to worry about. Jesus is in control. Jesus has his hands on the wheel. He doesn't need you to add your hand or to cover the brake. He certainly doesn't need your advice or your backseat drive. He's got this. He's in control of the situation. The God who died and rose again, the God who loves you and ascended the throne of all power above all, knows how this story ends. Let him drive. He's promised a good end. But that doesn't mean we're unconcerned. Right? Jesus is not unconcerned with the state of this world even. He is our head. And so he provides us with everything we need, protection and care, life, the inheritance of heaven, that hope to which we were called. He also has given marching orders to the body, the fullness of him who fills all things everything, in every way. But wait, that can't be right. It's hard enough to swallow that God's incomparably great power could even make me a saint. But complete Christ? Come on! We can give nothing to God that he doesn't already have. We already said he owns the universe. He needs nothing wants nothing. So how can we say that we complete Christ? In his infinite wisdom and power, the all-powerful God has chosen to need you. See, the world around us does not see our head, Christ, even we only see him by faith. But the world does see you, his body, the fullness of him who fills all things in every way. So fill up his body. How? Spread the message of our ascended king. Certainly, these are uncertain times. You're going to come across people who are worried, whether it's about what we're doing, or about where we're going, or about what's happening in this world today. It seems like the world has gone to hell in a handbasket. So when you find people who think that way, ask them, can I tell you something that gives me comfort in uncertain times? And tell them how Jesus lived, died, and rose. Tell them your king is in complete control. Pray that the Spirit would give you wisdom as you speak his words and give them revelation to understand. Jesus has promised he will go with you. He has sent his Spirit. He will accomplish what he wants. There's nothing to worry about. Elvis has left the building, and despite whatever conspiracy theories there may be, he's not coming back unless Jesus wants him to. But has Jesus left the building? Why did Jesus leave? He left to send the Spirit, who gives us hope, causes us to understand the hope we've been called to, God's glorious riches, and also his power. 
The same power that raised Jesus from the dead and will raise you. The same power by which he ascended to the highest place and rules the world for you. So he's in control. He sent you out as his messengers to fill up his body. But he's promised never to leave. So then, why did? Why did Jesus leave? So as your risen and ascended Savior King, he would be with you now and forever. Amen. Hear again the words of his promise. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Continue our worship service with the prayer of the church. <laughs> Blessed Jesus, you ascended to the right hand of your Father's majesty, power, and glory. Now you reign as eternal King of kings and Lord of lords. We praise you for your victory reign over sin, death, and hell. Ascended prophet, Equip your church to proclaim the precious gospel message of God's love for all the world. Give courage to our hearts, power to our words, and success to our efforts. Ascended High Priest, represent us before the Father as his own dear children and heirs. Defend us against Satan's accusation. Ask for the Father's rich blessings in our daily lives. Plead for his mercy and grace on our behalf. Ascended King, direct the affairs of governments and nations, that they may serve the best interests of your church. You are our Lord, Master, and King. As the disciples lifted their eyes to watch your ascension, so lift our eyes daily to look for your coming again in glory. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come quickly. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Give us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom of the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with faith and give you peace.
may not have figured out all the whys of why Jesus does what he does, we know he's still in control of this situation. Uh, but great comfort to us believers. I do want to mention that after the service this evening, those of you who are joining us on the actual day of the Ascension of our Lord, we do have a Zoom meeting set up with both last year's vicar, who this morning was called to Martin Luther College to be a tutor, and our next year's vicar, who uh, Jonathan Fleischman, who will be joining us, God willing, this evening on our Zoom call as well. Those are my announcements for this evening. I pray you're staying safe and healthy. We'll see you when we see you.